Can you hear me, everyone? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. Uh, my name is Will Collins, and I'm the Communications Manager for Arts Council Wood Buffalo. Thank you for joining us this evening for our Artist in Residency Showcase. So this evening, we're here with Carla White, who was from our Fall 2020 Residency, and Heather Morijo, who is our current resident artist and is actually here from well, she joined us on October 26th and is here with us until November 17th. So she is currently creating art in the region through the program. So this evening, we're gonna have some conversations with Carla and Heather about their residency experiences and talk a little bit about the Suncor Indigenous Artist Program, which is a brand new stream under Artist in Residency. Um, but before we begin, I would just like to recognize that as Arts Council, everything we do, whether it be living, working, or creating, is on the ancestral territories of the Dene, Cree, and Métis nations, as well as other Indigenous peoples. We believe that we are all treaty people together in our collective home within the boundaries of Treaty 8. And I would also like to acknowledge and welcome people from other treaty territories, for those of us joining us through the internet from other regions, as well as Heather Morijo, who joins us from Calgary. Um, I'd also just like to share a couple of housekeeping items. Um, for those who don't know, Arts Council Wood Buffalo is actually a nonprofit charitable organization that supports the growth and success of the arts in our region. And we're very grateful for our donors and sponsors, particularly Suncor, who is supporting the uh, Suncor Indigenous Artist Program right now. Um, it's our donors and sponsors that make these programs possible so we can hold really cool events like we are this evening. So um, for more information on how you can donate or sponsor, please visit our website at artscouncilwb.ca slash donate. Okay, so first, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the format of our evening, um, and then we'll get started so you can stop listening to me ramble. Um, first thing is, I'm going to interview Carla about her time in the Artist in Residency, and then we're going to pass over the virtual talking stick to Carla, who is going to actually interview Heather, and they're going to share their experiences and, and learn more about Heather's experience um, in her residency now. Um, so following the Q&A, please stick around because we're going to be showing the world premiere of Sparking Creativity, which is a short documentary about the healing power of art, which was made in collaboration with Arts Council Wood Buffalo and local media wizards, MacGuffin Media. Okay, so we want to make sure that you as an audience are also part of this. So you are welcome to ask questions. Um, so after the interviews with Carl and Heather, we'll be opening up the conversation to address as many of your questions as we can. Um, we don't have all night. We're going to try and keep it to a sort of a nice time frame so we're not all driven crazy sitting in front of a computer or watching um, Shaw Spotlight. Um, but you're invited to type your questions into whatever platform you're watching from, be it Facebook or YouTube or LinkedIn. And then we will we'll try to get through those questions and uh, see what Carl and Heather have to say. So uh, please stay tuned and hopefully we'll get to read your questions. <gasps> okay, so now enough of the uh, introductions. I would like to invite Miss Carla White to the virtual stage to join me in conversation. Welcome and good evening, Carla. Thanks for coming out tonight. How are you doing? Oh, oh my mic is muted. There you go. Now we can hear you. Okay. I'm doing awesome. well. <laughs> cool. Thanks for joining us this evening, taking time out of your busy schedule um, and for forever supporting Arts Council. We appreciate that. And let's just jump right in. Um, instead of me talking all night, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, who you are, and about your artistic practice? 
Well, my artistic practice started in uh, maybe a little unusual way. It started in Mr. Mellum's math class in junior high, where I was sent to the office for being the class clown. And that was um, probably my high school years. I was always making people laugh and or trying to make people laugh. And some of my teachers didn't appreciate that uh, side of me. But I actually decided I didn't go into the arts. Originally, I went into nursing. And uh, I, through my, my career, I've been a nurse, I've been a firefighter, I was dealing with other people's chaos and, and crises. And, uh, and then I left that world and became a success principles trainer and motivational speaker. And it wasn't until I um, contributed to several anthologies, books, that um, I stepped into the literary arts world and became an author, and uh, including uh, my story being accepted into the Chicken Soup for the Soul, and then carrying on from there to write my own book, um, Reignite Your Spark. And probably the most fun I have had in my whole career is when I took my wellness meets comedy shtick to the stage and uh, did a one woman show. That's fantastic. So what, what brought you to artist in residency and can you tell us about what you created during your residency? So the artist in residency, it was during the pandemic when I, I was making a real pivot. I wasn't able to do shows, uh, live shows anymore. And I was actually cleaning out my office and going through a notebook. And I'd taken a, a tourism class. And in the margin, I had written, we need a play about the fire. Uh, the wildfire in 2016 that we all experienced up here in, in Fort McMurray. And... Um, and I, there was something about that note that was just written randomly. It was a, you know, a fleeting thought that I thought, I'm going to contact the Arts Council. And I think I reached out to you, Will, and said, okay, so I have this idea. Um, I need to have a consultation to figure out who we can find to write this play. <laughs> So I had no intentions of um, being the the writer because I didn't I had no experience in it, um, and uh, and I got on a call with Louie and we started to to have this conversation about my vision and uh, really I saw it as um, I had seen come from away which was about the the nine eleven tragedy and uh, what happened in in Newfoundland mm -hmm. and it was like that's the kind of um, play that I really think would would do well to show the world really about the resilient, amazing people that are in this region. And so we had these conversations and one thing led to another. And uh, Louie said, listen, we've got this artist in residence program. Why don't we make that um, the, you know, what the the project? Right. And, uh, and so it went from there. It was uh, they brought me on as the artist in residence. Um, and because of, of COVID and the pandemic, it actually worked a little bit better that I was here locally and we could right. um, go from there. Okay, cool. So why, why do you think um, talking about the wildfire now is important? And as, a, as somebody who enjoys humor as much as I do, why do you think, um, or how does humor fit into this play? And maybe you can tell us the title of this the, the play as well. Yeah, the, um, the the working title originally was, I can't remember what it was. It was something about fire. Um, but as we got into it and and writing the play, it became really clear that the, the title was uh, forged by fire because it really was going to show the strength and the resilience of the people of Fort McMurray is, is what we wanted to depict in it. Um, the reason probably that it, I think the timing is right on this is that we just had our fifth anniversary. And I remember hearing early on after the fire that um, someone somewhere, some expert said it takes five years to recover from a mm -hmm. disaster like this. And that actually became sort of one of the questions that we asked in the interviews of the people was, do you feel that you have healed and what does that look like? So that kind of is the, the reason why it, it worked really well um, to have it start, be started now. And um, I talk in the documentary uh, a little bit about 
the the timeline and how I you know I really wanted to have this ready for the fifth anniversary and then I realized mm -hmm. no that this is more of a timeless piece that um, ultimately will help people not just that have experienced a, a wildfire but that have experienced life and what I call the the catastrophes of life and um, we've, we've gone through a lot. We've been through up here in Fort McMurray. We had the floods in 2020. We had the pandemic. We've had economic churn down. There, there's been all of these really highly emotional events in our life that um, I just wanted to help people through that. And humor actually became one of the um, things that I realized in my own life was the healing power of humor. Interesting you should mention that. I, I feel like I agree with that philosophy. Humor is something that has helped me in so many ways throughout my life. And, you know, anyone who's worked with me will, will know that I like to inject a little humor throughout the day, where and where and whenever possible. Um, but do you do you feel like this was the right avenue for discussing discussing this topic of, in, of tragedy and trauma? Yeah, you know, we, I've had so many discussions around, um, in critical incident stress debriefing and stress and, and sort of the psychological sides of trauma and drama. And um, ultimately, what, believe me, there, there was plenty of drama, trauma, catastrophes that went on as a part of the fire and then everything that's happened since then. And what I found with humor is it releases the tension of the story we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so it can lighten things up. And when we are in that place of, um, we're not in that place of fear, we move more into, into love and joy and, and laughter, mm -hmm. then we're actually putting our body back in a more relaxed and natural state. And that's when our body can take over that innate capability mm. it has of healing. So it's, there's, it, there's science behind it. There's um, all of these um, amazing attributes that, that humor has. And so it doesn't seem like that, you know, it's like, well, we want to, we really want to focus on that. And believe me, the very first run through of the play, <laughs> we, we finished and I went, okay, so much for a traumedy. I mean, it was, it was that, first outpouring of of the tragedy and telling the story and um and it was the the piece that i needed to get out as a part of my healing process for the for the fire i got you and so you mentioned you know um how the, the importance of healing through this process did you find that there was times where you veered off into focusing on only the story and humor and healing didn't really play a part of that. Did you? How did you bring yourself back into that? Well, we, a, a lot of that had to do with um, the dramaturg. Um, part of the the residency was uh, that Arts Council Wood Buffalo actually said, "Yeah, okay, we get it that you are a writer, but you've no experience in writing plays. So we'll hire a dramaturg." I didn't even know what a dramaturg was, but I soon found out. Uh, that they are basically like a writing coach. And um, Camille, they hired, uh, we hired the most amazing dramaturg. And uh, you'll see Camille in the documentary. But Camille um, helped me to then take that story and we, we worked through it and cut out pieces and what's important. And mm -hmm. so it was a real process of uh, just sort of paring down and getting to the real story. And, um, it the other thing that happened and I, again i talk more about this is uh, a bit of a surprise was uh the amount of healing that happened for the actors that were a part of the process for the mm. stage reading and that it gave them an opportunity to kind of process some emotions maybe that they hadn't um, given themselves permission to feel. And so it was a really, uh, at first I was kind of like, sorry, not sorry that I made you cry um, because that's all a part of the healing journey. And most yeah. times why we don't heal from these things is because we don't give ourselves permission to actually feel that sadness and that fear. Mm -hmm. And that's all a part mm -hmm. of it. It's not just one big joke. It is a part of 
completely feeling your life, all of it, even the, you know, the, the good, the bad, and what I call the fugly, the, the, those, those things that go, make you go, what the, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it is, that is part of the healing journey and, and humor is just one part of it that, um, that we bring in as parts of the, it's a, it's a dramatic story, but we bring in that lightness to make it easier so that when people leave, after watching it, they feel lighthearted. And because they've seen just the best parts of the, the human spirit, which is is the people and um, yeah. and how resilient and they've healed. I think you may have even answered my next question, which was basically, I was gonna ask you what you might've found surprising or interesting about the process. And it sounds to me like you that may be it, what you just described. Yeah, for me, I, I think I was surprised because I really felt like I had processed the the emotions around the fire uh, pretty pretty well, like the trauma that we went through initially, and uh, you know I was I was pretty transparent on Facebook about you know this is what I'm feeling and and kind of my moments of of fear and and uncertainty that were coming up, and I didn't I don't think I really realized just how much more healing. Uh, the deeper the healing could go and um, listening to other people's stories. We did interviews and uh, you'll see a little bit of that in, in the documentary, but it was like being back there, hearing the stories of other people five years after the fire uh, that really brought just this cathartic, um, beautiful energy around it. And I actually had a, a big aha about, healing something from my past, like my childhood, something that I had not realized had come up in my reaction to during the fire and post fire and, and everything that um, it was like, wow, okay, that is affecting me from 30 years mm. ago. And it showed up here. And now I feel as though I've been able to heal all of that. Sort wow, of that that's very powerful. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was very cool. Wow, and um, okay, I uh, I feel like I don't want to give too many things away from the documentary that's going to follow this. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and just sure. talk about the artist in residency program itself. And um, do you feel that your experience has influenced you your artistic practice since you finished? Absolutely. So. I honestly, the artist in residence, one of the, the biggest things that it, um, it allowed me to do was actually step in and own that I am an artist, I'm a creator. And um, it's just been, yes. <laughs> um, it's, I remember having conversations with Louie about, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a creator. I don't, I don't see myself as a creative person. And, and uh it's, it's really given me that opportunity to just step in and own that, that that's who I am. That's what I'm here on this earth to do is to create. Um, and the, the cool part, okay, the question went away. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether I answered your question or not. <laughs> You're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. <laughs> uh, oh, there, there's a, I, I, I love that we've got people behind the scenes that are, are making this easy. Um, yeah, so it has continued on my artistic practice of writing. Um, I do writing daily now, which um, I kind of gotten out of the practice of doing that. And I'm back into that now doing morning papers. But the um, can I tell you about my most exciting thing? Please do, please. Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you What do you have coming up next? Tell us. Okay, what's there on. you go. Ask the question. <laughs> um, so honestly, I went into after the Arts Council um, artist in residency was over. It was like, okay, now what? I have a partially written play, and um, we did a staged reading, but it wasn't sort of the big vision. And I I thought, well, I I want this to continue. So I actually spent a little time. Um, getting uh well qualified certified accepted by the canadian council as an artist so that was that was a huge thing for me i applied like three times and they kept saying no 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 and uh, finally was accepted and then put in a request for funding and i have received a funding grant from the canadian council of the arts 
for a continuation of the play. So in May 2022, we will be holding a community event and it will be a staged reading at Heritage Park. So it's going to be an outdoor event. Um, it'll be healing. It'll be amazing. I can't wait to share the play with the world and with um, with local artists, like we'll have um, some local artists uh, showing up to to be in this play. I'm so excited about that. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, you you kind of covered a few topics that I I really enjoyed, and you know, one coming together with other artists and working with other artists like the dramaturg and Lou A and myself even, but also the fact that you are now allowing yourself to call yourself an artist. That's a big deal. Yeah. pretty cool and just you know the benefits that you know you've finished your residency but you're still continuing on that path it's not like a time frame of a few weeks and then it's over this is something that's cumulative that keeps building and growing and evolving which is really exciting i find so uh thank you for sharing your story and now i'm gonna i think let's take an opportunity to switch roles a little bit sure. i'm gonna step back and uh, get off the screen because I'm sure everybody's tired of seeing me. And I'm gonna pass the microphone over to you, Carla, and I'm gonna ask you to um, interview Heather Morijo, who is our current artist in residency. And she's the first to take part in the Suncor Indigenous Artist Program. So Akshaya backstage, could you please get my ugly face off the screen and please bring <laughs> the lovely Heather Morijo to the screen so Heather and Carla can share their experiences. Thanks, Will. Thanks. There she is. Hello, Heather. Hello. How are you, Carla? I'm I'm well. Actually, I'm, my hard part is over. Now I get to um, have the privilege of uh, putting you on the hot seat. <laughs> and it's not too it's not too hot. It's, it's <laughs> thank you. Well, first, I just want to uh, welcome you to Fort McMurray and the RMWB. I say RMWB because uh, when I try to actually say the whole thing, I stumble all over it. So welcome uh, to our region. We're so happy to have you here. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your artistic practice. Yeah, thank you. Oki Natui Atista Aki, Tansei. Minitao Wapos and Eskew. That was Blackfoot and Cree. My spirit name is Holy Rabbit Woman. And I am mixed Indigenous, so my heritage is Cree, Metis, and Tanaha, as well as Settler, Celtic, British, and French. And so it's been a wonderful opportunity to come here and connect. My arts journey started with goldsmithing and jewelry design. I did that for 13 years and then retrained in permaculture design and have over the last five years really directed my career into expressing my indigeneity and healing through my art and um, have connected to some traditional cultural teachings that have really transformed how I do my practice and my daily life and, and it's been wonderful. Wonderful. So you are in the middle of your residency with the Suncor Indigenous um, Artist Program. What made you apply? How did you come to, to find out about it or to, to um, you were telling me before, this isn't your first residency, but it's your first out of town. It is. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to be an artist in residency with Fuse 33 Makerspace in Calgary. And that was a wonderful experience because it had all of the studio that you could hope for uh, in that space. And then I want to be like a career artist that goes and travels around the world and does artists and residencies. And this was the first opportunity I had to leave Calgary. I learned about it through the Calgary Arts Development website and through their newsletter and applied and was super excited and fortunate to have gotten the opportunity. Well, we're thrilled that Fort McMurray is your first stop on your worldwide tour. So I, I cannot wait to hear how where you go to next. That's exciting, that's exciting. Um, so you've been doing, what have you been focused on? I know you were doing some workshops and you've, you've kind of got two things going. You're doing some creating and you've done some workshops. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the first week we had a workshop at the 
Keanu College and we did resin workshops. So everyone got an opportunity to take home a finished piece of resin and then come back and pick up a larger finished piece of resin and just get an introduction into what the art form is like, where resin art came from. And then this past weekend, I got to do a virtual pine needle weaving workshop with Fort Chippewan members of the community and we made a yeah there we go medicine basket out of pine needle weaving and pine needle weaving is a traditional art form of the Tunaha nation very cool very cool yeah. so tell me a little bit more about what makes um indigenous art unique and kind of talk about the the difference between traditional and contemporary i think that's the the right way to put it contemporary indigenous art absolutely so any art created by an indigenous person qualifies as indigenous art okay. it's not just the theme of indigeneity so you can be making plaster molds and those are still indigenous art and so when we're talking about traditional indigenous art, we're talking about an art form that has been passed down through generation to generation and carries sacred teachings. And there's often rights associated with sharing that art form and those teachings. So um, pine needle weaving does qualify as a traditional art form. My contemporary art form, resin casting, I, I mix it in with the traditional art form of pine needle weaving. And this is just a contemporary expression of who I am, the teachings that I've received as an Indigenous person walking the Red Road and the things that I've experienced. So that would probably be the, the Cliff Notes version of the introduction. Um, that piece that you're looking at is called Swing on the Spiral. So that is a mixture mm -hmm. of resin and pine needles and sacred medicines. And it carries the teachings of the medicine wheel in it. That's so. beautiful. Thank Beautiful. You. And that's something that you created what, since you've been here, or this is a piece of your art from before? This is a piece of my art from before. And this one is actually at the Calgary John Howard Society. And I'm working to reproduce it while I'm here as well. That's about a two foot wide sculpture. And I'm also working on a series of Northern Lights um, mm. paintings, resin paintings with pine needle weavings around them right now. So that's the resin work oh that I gosh. do. Yeah. Okay. And, and so where can I buy that? When it's, well, <laughs> when it's finished, we're going to have, I've just received uh, funding that allows me to set up my own professional website. So heathermorjo.com. And I will be hopefully by the new year around Christmas time, be setting up a place to purchase and, uh, yeah, and then I'll have pieces up for sale. Fantastic. So tell me with you've you've had some experiences with residencies and when you came here, did you have sort of some expectations and how has the experience um, either fulfilled those expectations? Did you have any surprises? Uh, yes, absolutely. The biggest surprise was the studio space. So the Ken Keanu College has been um, unfortunately, sadly, has lost funding for some of its arts departments. So they have this incredible studio space for printmaking, which has got all of this really expensive equipment and infrastructure, and it's not being used. So I get that whole space to myself, which is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a dream come true. Like I could, I could not even imagine having a space like that in Calgary to myself, right? So that's been a, a huge surprise. Uh, getting to know the region has been really exciting. I'm looking forward to going to the Bison Sanctuary up in Fort Mackay um, mm -hmm. this coming weekend on Sunday, hopefully, if the weather is nice for me. And, you know, it's just been very welcoming, wonderful opportunity to connect with other artists and and get to know the region and the, the many challenges that this region has faced over the last while, too. It's been it's been very humbling to learn about those. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, that's, it's an amazing experience to go up and see the, the, uh, the bison for sure. Um, talk a little bit about, so we, we talked a lot about the healing through the arts and uh, that's a significant theme of the sparking creativity that we'll see after this, but do you see a theme of healing through the arts in your own practice and and your own journey your own work that you've done is is there been any kind of healing theme for you 
Absolutely. So I actually was an award winner for the Calgary Mayor's Arts Champions this year, the ATB's Healing Through the Arts Award. So that was my first Absolutely. artist award ever, and it was a great opportunity. And my journey in arts has been directly connected to recovery from addiction, mental health struggles, and decolonizing, right? And, mm -hmm. and letting go of some of those narratives that we grew up with that told us that, um, you know, being Indigenous is not enough. And so healing through those experiences, through my art and feeling validated, one of the most powerful quotes that I often refer back to in my art practice is by Louis Riel that says, my people will sleep for a hundred years and when they awake, it will be the artists who give them their spirit back. And so that to me is a profoundly healing, powerful statement. And a big part of what drives me is, you know, I never know what's how my art will impact people once it's outside of me. And so it's really important to honor my own healing, the healing of my ancestors and for future generations. So beautiful, so beautiful. Um, do you have any tips or suggestions that you would make to anybody that um, might be thinking about applying to be an artist in residence or or in the actual Suncor Indigenous Arts Pro Artist Program? The first thing I'd recommend is reach out to Nick Vardy. He is the Indigenous um, Director for uh, Wood, Arts Council of Wood Buffalo. He has made this experience wonderful, made sure I had everything I needed and felt very welcome to the region and connected me with elders for the teaching opportunities that I have. So I'd reach out to Nick first, if you're an Indigenous artist and you want to connect. And then when when you are accepted, pre-plan what you're going to bring. Because <laughs> the art supply stores that are in Calgary might not necessarily exist here. So there was a lot of shipping things up from Calgary before I came and stuffing a lot of stuff into my little car and bringing my cat along with me to the Airbnb. So, so pre-plan and, and um, you know, consider it, it, it's not a cabin in the woods. This is definitely an urban center, but I would definitely say, think of it that way, you know, just so right. you have experience. Yeah, fair enough. When, when we're up here in the North, we, we often don't, you know, we, we, I guess, sometimes probably think about those kinds of things about what we don't have here and we do we have a lot of amazing things here but there's there is certain specifically if you're you've got art like very unique art um supply requirements yeah the resin shipments i've had a couple of those come up since i got here because i realized oh i don't have this pigment oh i don't have enough resin so that was a couple little things that i had to track down is the pigment um, I'm, I'm fascinated by all of that. Is the pigment then a natural, like, do you have um, sort of a natural drawn from nature kind of colors? Is that how it works or? To, to be honest, no, I am crazy for mica pigments, which are very vibrant, iridescent, color shifting and, and have different layers to them. I, I try and focus, like right now I'm going through a, a specific focus on the medicine wheel. So I use those colors. Um, but right now with the Northern Light series, I'm using a lot of neons. I'm using glow in the dark pigments, <laughs> right? So I'm I'm really, I just love pigments. That's one yeah. of my favorite things. And um, with resin, it, it is, a, it, you know, resin comes from nature. When the pine tree is wounded, it will release resin in order to protect itself. When it's fossilized, it becomes amber. We think of Jurassic Park. But what we use today in art is synthetic. It is it is a product of science. <laughs> Fair enough. That's, you know, we, we, you're still maintaining sort of that traditional um, learnings. And I love the, the part about the sacred learnings that you, you bring forward from the elders. Can you talk a little bit more about maybe some of those learnings that you been able to bring forward within your residency? Sure. Um, so one of the things that I pointed out when we were doing our pine needle weaving is it's a form of coiled basketry. And if you look at any part of the pine tree, whether it's the branches growing, the needles growing, or the pine cones, they all grow in a spiral, right? So if you actually pay attention to the shape of the way the, the pine, co pine cone um, pieces grow, everything is in a spiral. 
So it makes sense that our artwork, the pine needle baskets are also in a spiral. And this connects for our DNA, the galaxies, right? It's, uh, in, it's also called the Fibonacci golden mean, right? And so this is our golden ratio. And so this is a really important natural teaching that is emulated in the indigenous artwork of, of <laughs> pine needle weaving. So that was one of the things we got to discuss this past weekend. Very cool. Uh, I'm getting the message that um, I have one time for one more question. So let me make it a really good one. Um, I'd love to know more about the holy rabbit woman, um, <laughs> a spirit animal. But I just one of the what is uh, one thing you plan to sort of take away from this experience and moving forward? What what do you hope to have be the sort of the big outcome of your artist in residence um, experience? Having the opportunity to, to connect with the people in the land of this region on my own terms, right? So without it being um, a tra tragedy or something in the news or something that I've heard from someone else, to be able to connect with the land and the rivers and, and the animals in my own and the people in my own capacity and make my own decisions about what's happening here, I think was really powerful learning for me, something I really came here with the intention and open heart to do. So I would say that was probably the biggest thing that I hope to experience while I'm here. Well, we certainly appreciate having you here with that openness to to experience uh, everything that we have to offer here. Um, that's not often the case when we have people visit. They don't often uh, see all of that. So we truly appreciate you bringing your art and your heart and um, all of all of you to our region. And uh, with that, I'm going to. Um, ask the magic wizards behind the scenes to bring Will back to uh, to give us our next uh, our next actions. Your exciting documentary. Yay. Yes. Thanks, Heather. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> Thanks. This was uh, really exciting for me to just sit back and listen to the conversation instead of being nervous about asking questions and wondering how many people are out there in cyberspace. Uh, looking at my my uh, hairdo or something. So, thank you for letting us just hear about your your experience and your work, and um, you know what you've been sort of experiencing since you've been here. Um, now we're just going to take a few minutes for some questions from the audience, um, and I've actually come up with a few questions as well. Um, so, one thing I'm thinking about just while I was listening to you is if you have any recommendations for anyone who wants to practice healing through the arts. This question goes to either of you or both of you. Um, Heather, since you were just speaking, I'm not sure if you want to go first, but uh, do you have any recommendations for anyone who wants to practice healing through the arts? I think I might hijack Carla's answer here because I heard <laughs> her mention the morning pages. Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. I went through it about two years ago. It's a 12 week um, artist recovery workbook and textbook. And it was one of the most profound life changing experiences. I write every morning as well. Um, you know, and just, just diving into arts with abandon, right? Just fearlessly, you know, we're only here for a blip of time. So just dive in. Yeah, and you, I, I have to tell our audience that you actually recommended that to me the other day as well, and it's on my radar. So, yeah. Uh, Carla, did you want to add anything to that, or did she steal your yeah. thunder? <laughs> no, no, not at all. I, I think that's a beautiful recommendation. Uh, one of the things that Louie and I remember, I remember talking about is that whole idea of seeing ourselves as artists. And um, I, I almost thought it would be helpful to redefine that so many people are out there who are creative and they're they're doing things for fun and they've never really considered themselves artists like I was. I uh, hadn't really considered that if we start to look at being an artist as being a creator, take a look in your own life. Like what is it that you want to to just spend more time, you know, 
expressing yourself, expressing yourself in whatever way. Go to a paint night, go to try new things. Um, just be open to seeing where uh, you could bring more creativity and and arts into your into your world and I think it'll that's a great out. recommendation i think that's really wise um okay so uh, another question for heather um where can people learn more about indigenous arts do you have any recommendations for where people might just start exploring if they want to explore that there, I really wish I had my cheat sheet because there are there's the Indigenous Arts Council, there is the Indigenous Curator Collective um, here in Northern Alberta. I think there's a brand new cooperative that just opened, but I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Um, you know, and when when we're done COVID restrictions and you have the opportunity to travel, you know, there's a website where you can look up what region, whose land you're on, right? Mm -hmm. And just find out, you know, who are the original peoples of these lands? Go find out if they have a trading post, right? In um, Tsunaha, they have a number of places, right, where you can go and see the different artists from that area and support them, right? There's always Facebook. Um, Shop Indigenous Artists is a Facebook group that I, I love, so. Um, oh my goodness, there's so many. Just just, just call out, just be like, hello, are there any indigenous <laughs> artists here? <laughs> yes, <laughs> right? <laughs> like there's- Google knows, Google would know. <laughs> Google knows, yeah, well, I there's think you raised a good point. Finding out where you are and looking at, you know, where that is. You know, I grew up near the Six Nations Reserve in Ontario and I haven't lived in Ontario for over 20 years, but I wish I could go back in time and have spent more time digging into that while I was while I was there, you know. So I think that's a really smart suggestion. So thanks. And sorry for putting you on the spot for trying to remember a bunch of resources. But <laughs> it's good to know that we live in the age of the Internet where we can uh, dig up this kind of stuff. So um, one more question. I'm going to now switch it to Carla. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you have some big plans. You got a uh, grant from Canada Council for the Arts. When can we expect to hear more about your next steps so that artists can pay attention and maybe keep an ear out for potentially participating? Well, the, this uh, phase of the, I'm going into another creation mode. I've, um, I'm bringing uh, Camille back, the dramaturg back to work with me to finish the last, we've got about 60 minutes of the play completed. And now we're going to go back in and work on the, kind of that last 20 minutes um, of the, the production. So that that will be kind of from November to about February. And then March, 2022, we're going to start um, finding our, our new director, uh, we're going to be looking for artists to come and play with us. And uh, yeah, so it'll be kind of March uh, when you'll start to hear a little bit more about um, Forge by Fire. And the, of course, we're, our goal is to have the stage greeting in May. So that will be to coincide kind of with the month that um, in the play, there's actually a, a section or a, a I guess it's not an act, but um, a section called uh, There's Something About May. And uh, so that became kind of May is uh, not necessarily on the anniversary of the fire, but certainly within the month of May, I want to uh, have that staged reading. So we'll, right. we'll be getting in March and April, we'll be starting to line up the local artists to come in and uh, audition to be a part of this, this play. That's great. And I'm sure, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you'll get in touch with Arts Council to share any artist calls with artists in our region so that they can, uh, you know, potentially uh, participate in this. So, and speaking of, uh, you know, plays and um, healing and art and creativity, I think it's time that we wrap up the Q&A session and move to the next section, which is um, our uh, documentary premiere. So first of all, I would just like to say thank you both Carla and Heather for joining us and taking part of this conversation. We appreciate you so much, so thank you. 
Uh, thank you to everybody who's watching this evening and to everybody who asked questions and to Akshaya behind the scenes who's helping make sure that I don't crash any <laughs> programs. We appreciate you. Um, I'd also just like to remind you that, uh, you know, we're open for sponsors and donors. So if you want to donate, um, we welcome that. And that helps bring great artists to our region to share their, their ideas and their creativity and their insights. Um, also, I want to just mention uh, to watch out for an update about Artist in Residency Spring 2022. We're going to be making some announcements in December. And uh, it sounds like we're going to be opening up applications again, so please stay tuned. Um, and then uh, a shout out to Keanu Theatre and Arts Centre for accommodating and helping us out and for finding Heather some studio space. We're grateful that she has a space nearby. That's pretty cool. Um, also want to say uh, thank you and I send a shout out to MacGuffin Media who um, basically they filmed and edited and shot and put a whole bunch of creativity into the documentary which we are about to share called Sparking Creativity. Um, I just want to say thank you once again everyone for watching and tuning in. Thanks again Carla and Heather and Akshaya and peace out and enjoy the documentary. Please send us some comments on social media to let us know what you think about the documentary. And um, you can also watch this, this uh, discussion again on our YouTube channel. So thank you very much and have a great evening, folks. This is when we do awkward stuff while we wait for the documentary to start. Should I get my guitar? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, sparking creativity. <laughs>